everyone and welcome to Rad Chat, the first therapeutic radiographer-led oncology podcast. So welcome to podcast number 44. My name's Joe McNamara and I'm joined by fellow host Naaman Jolka Anderson. Hi everyone. So a big thank you to our last guests, Kath Holborn and Emma Hallam, who talked about survivorship and late effects. If you haven't had a chance, please do go and take a listen. So I'm really pleased to introduce our guest for this evening, Victoria Cuthill, who's going to be discussing genomics and her Macmillan Fellowship. So hello, Victoria. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, both of you. It's lovely to be here and um, thank you for inviting me. Number 44, that's a lot of podcasts. So um, (laughs) well done to both of you because it's brilliant um, and really needed. So yeah, thanks for the invite. No, oh, well, thank you so much for joining us. I'm I've been so excited about this podcast, specifically because I have to admit it's really an area that I don't feel I know enough about. Um, so hopefully it'll be a nice bit of CPD for me as well this evening. Um, so Vicky, what we usually do is start with a bit of an introduction about your career pathway and about yourself. So if you don't mind. Yeah, so scarily, I was just thinking about this earlier, I've been a nurse now since 1999, which makes me A, very old, um, and means that I've got 23 years experience now, which is really scary, Uh, but um, I've never had a plan, some people do, and that's great, Um, but for all of those that are starting out in your different roles out there, it really doesn't matter if you don't have a plan, Um, but I started out in intensive care, Um, I was an intensive care nurse for four or five years at St George's, and I loved the, the job. And I only left the role because actually I was moving out of London. Um, And so it's all, you know, I I could have stayed there for the rest of my career. Moved out of London um, and actually uh, responded to an advert for a uh, bowel trainee specialist nurse post. I'd been interested in stoma care um, when I was on ITU um, and thought, oh, that sounds really interesting. Um, And uh, started a job uh, looking after patients at that point with benign uh, bowel conditions. Um, and then, uh, you know, just wanted to kind of experience different aspects of, um, you know, bowels um, and all things bowel related. I took a job then at the Homerton Hospital as the colorectal cancer nurse specialist. Um, and at that point, it was a fairly uh, new-ish, you know, role to be um, a specialist nurse. Of course, you know, it's, it's really common now. Um, and from then, from that, um, I became interested in in more about sort of what we call the genetics of of cancer. I remember going on a study day, just a study day, one day at St Mark's where I work now um, and was introduced to the idea of inherited bowel cancer conditions and thought it was really fascinating. I then had to to take a a career break because um, I had children. I was out of nursing for three years, uh, moved again, this time near to St Mark's Hospital, which is a national bowel hospital, and saw a really fascinating job advertised in somewhere called the polyposis registry. I'd never heard of it at the time. I'd never heard of people with polyposis conditions, uh, but it's actually a series of conditions where people are at much higher risk of developing bowel cancer. So it was my kind of specialist subject of bowel cancer and rolled into genomics as well. Uh, So that's how I got into the field and this summer I'll have been there for 10 years. I started out as a nurse practitioner and now I'm the lead nurse and and manager of the unit. What's the best part of the job at the moment? What does a normal day look like for you? The best part is that there is definitely no normal day and I think a lot of the people listening to this podcast, no matter whether you're a therapeutic radiographer, student, uh, allied health professional, can that is one of the best things that we have about the job. But um, essentially since last June I've taken a secondment opportunity with Macmillan Cancer. So things are quite different for me at the moment because I do three days a week in the NHS and two days a week with Macmillan and that's about, well we'll talk about that obviously in the podcast but it's about raising awareness of genomics and cancer care helping develop education with their professional development and knowledge team um, both internally and externally Um, and so my NHS work is at the moment really management orientated on managing the unit and I have a a team of nurses uh, but I used to have a very active role be a nurse practitioner do nurse-led clinics uh, request scans um, and uh, I was you know I am an independent prescriber so lots of nurse-led clinics looking after patients um, really varied plus all the management staff management um, and kind of national work 
uh, that's involved when you run a sort of specialist service. So hugely varied, and that's, I guess, why we all do what we do. So Vicky, being a fellow um, Macmillan fellow, I know it's an amazing team to work in and the opportunities are great, but what is it that you're working on at the moment? So I do loads, so raising the awareness like I was talking about earlier, so lots and lots of kind of presentations, maybe speaking to different professional groups. So when I first started, I, I did a discussion with the allied health professional group, um, go to strategy meetings, meet with people like lead nurse groups and um, get very involved part of my role is sponsored by health education england so um you know get involved with things like the genomic medicine service and um, work with um, maybe the chief nurses to kind of advise uh, i've got national roles in things like the lynch transformation project and um, so kind of get increasing awareness um, speaking to as many groups of professionals as possible um, and obviously doing a lot of work with nurses and AHPs um, to, to kind of help people not feel so threatened by this topic and, and see the relevance to their role um, and explain, you know, if they feel they need sort of um, help and where to go for learning, like doing this podcast at the end, you know, will provide some resources so people don't feel so daunted by all. Believe me, if I can do this and I can understand it, anybody can i promise you it isn't as hard as sometimes it's made out to look um just kind of going back slightly vicky but you know you talked about having a bit of a career break i think there's been a lot of talk at the minute i think across twitter over the past few months about return to practice and how important it is especially at the moment how did you find that transition from being off and then going back in i was terrified before i started the job but actually it wasn't so bad. What was quite handy was that I timed it. So I'd, I was just under three years now in nursing and it's probably similar in, in other professions. You can only be out of practice for a certain amount of time before you have to do a return to practice course. Now I didn't have to do the return to practice course, but in some ways, maybe that would have given me a bit of confidence, you know, when I came back. And also I was coming back, um, I'd gone on maternity leave at a band seven level and I, I happened to come back in at a, I mean, it's, it's, we're more than just our bands, but it was a band seven. So that meant a degree of autonomy in the role. So when I first started, I remember thinking, oh my goodness, you know, they're going to expect me to know everything and I have to do nurse led clinics. And, but like any new job, it doesn't you know, matter whether you've had five minutes out or five years out, there is a period of learning the new role. And I guess one of the advantages of the job that I was going into was that I was dealing with a group of rare conditions. And so it didn't, I wouldn't have, had any knowledge no matter what my background was I had to be taught about certain things so I think it's like anything it's scary and you just have to kind of crash into it and do it and there'll be days where you think what am I doing but mostly if you've got a supportive team and you've got people that you feel that you can ask and talk to and get advice from and I was lucky enough to have that then normally it's fine <laughs> so um, you know people if you're listening don't be put off um, by returning and um, you know it, it can seem really daunting but I'm living proof that it's completely doable oh that's good and I think the support network is brilliant I've had a few people on talking about advanced practice and how they're doing far too many things for their 37 and a half hours a week so probably like Joe is normally doing double the amount of work but always getting it done but it's that support that really counts whether you're coming back to work or afterwards um yeah definitely so you've talked about kind of what you do what is genomics and why is it important in an oncology setting <sighs> yes my favorite subject so when we think about genomics we really need to think about um what is gene so it's um a, a section of dna that provides instructions it's as simple as that it doesn't need to be made any more complicated than that it provides instructions to create our characteristics so it's why we have the hair color we have our eye color um, and uh, when we group all of our genes together and we have around 20 to 25,000 genes and um, then that is our whole uh, genome if you like so all of the genes together make up our genome and that is genomics so genomics is the whole thing um, when we're talking uh, you know about this area specifically and when we're talking about genomics in healthcare we're talking about the impact that our genes have on health and disease and it's as simple as that and how this topic can help us 
help our patients, if you like. That's probably it in a nutshell. So, Vicky, can I just ask then, so in terms of kind of your role, how does how does the genetics essentially allow you to better support patients? So I, I look after patients who have uh, an inherited predisposition to bowel cancer. So we identify patients, so quite often it will be, if we're talking about something like Lynch syndrome, for example, and I mention that specifically because today is Lynch syndrome awareness day, and um, so we're all going dotty for Lynch syndrome today. Um, but normally somebody will be diagnosed with a bowel cancer, um, and then uh, through uh, doing histopathology or checking the tumour sample uh, will identify uh, that this patient might potentially be at risk of Lynch syndrome um, and we will do genetic testing um, on the patient uh, and look closely at the tumour and if that's identified um, then we've got not just the patient in front of us that's important uh, but also the family. So we've got the patient where it really really matters because they will be put on surveillance programs. It could alter the treatments, the medications that they're offered, um, and it will be very, very important for ensuring that family members are tested. And it may may definitely mean the difference between a family member uh, preventing people from getting bowel cancer um, and not knowing about any of this going on and getting bowel cancer. And I think that's the key component when we're talking about predisposition syndromes our work is really about trying to prevent people getting an unnecessary cancer and that's really important and that's quite different from looking at say uh, what we call a sporadic cancer so we all know that cancer is really really common one in two of us is said to get cancer in our lifetime and of course as we go through our lives as we do things like age as we do every day um, or we smoke or we are exposed to harmful UV rays our cells acquire uh, variants um, throughout our lifetime and cancers can develop um, but we can know a lot from that cancer from that tumour we can do genetic sequencing or uh, profiling on that tumour uh, but it's just mutations that are within that tumour so um, that will give us lots of information, but the person, you know, they can't pass those those variants onto their children. Um, it's not an inherited condition, but it still will give us lots of information versus the patients I look after where that, um, variant, if you like, is present in every cell. Uh, it was developed at the point of conception um, and they can pass that on uh, to their children. And it's quite important to realise the differences between somebody with inherited disease and then when we're doing profiling of a person's tumour um, and advising treatments um, and, and measures just on that tumour itself. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Uh, so it's quite nice that you split it in two different directions. If I ask you about the inherited side, how do you approach that conversation with someone who comes in with that? So it's the first time they've found out this diagnosis. How do you approach the conversation around okay, well, you have children, what's the next step? And then the next step for their children? I mean, it is, it is, a, it, there's no doubt about it, it can be a really difficult conversation. Because if you're dealing with somebody who's also been diagnosed with a bowel cancer or any cancer, then think about how much information patients have to take in. They're being told they have a cancer, then they're being told that actually you know, they might be eligible for this thing called genetic testing. Oh, and that means that, you know, maybe their children are at risk. So we've got family members brought into it as well. Um, but at the back of your mind, you've always got to think about the potential benefits. So if you can explain things in simple ways, and that's really important, don't get tied up in knots with the complexities of things. It's about how it's going to affect the patient. So, you know, a simple way would be, um, you know, your tumour has shown uh, a possibility of something called Lynch syndrome and it's really important that we find out about that because actually it could potentially alter the treatments that we offer you um, and also uh, it could be passed down 
um, from you to your children and that is really important because you've developed bowel cancer and actually we want to prevent anyone else in your family from getting cancer so it, it's focusing in on what's important to us all and that's protecting family members preventing people from getting bowel cancer or any other cancer if we're thinking about breast cancer in BRCA uh, for example um, and also that there's the hope that we may be able to tailor treatments to patients as well. So they are difficult conversations, but you know, I think sometimes we shy away from things if we think it's got genomics or genetics in the title. Um, but actually as healthcare professionals in all of our fields, we have complex conversations with people every single day. Um, and of course, we have those conversations within our comfort zone. So if that's therapeutic radiography, you know, it's about how we're going to deliver treatments, getting patients comfortable, make, making people reassured. Um, but of course, this is just an expansion of those conversations that we're used to having with people. And if they're going to have really important effects on people's diagnosis and the success of treatment and can things like cancer prevention, then, you know, it doesn't have to be complicated. We just need to dive in, have that conversation with somebody, pick up on their cues um, and, and, and see where the conversation leads us. And nine, nine times out of 10, patients will be delighted that they feel that you're doing something to help them. Some people will naturally be scared off, will need more time. Very, very few patients um, will refuse, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't still have that conversation. It's really important. How do people get genetic testing done and how long does it normally take? So there's various routes um, into the system. So it might be that you are what we call the affected person. So you have a history of cancer. For If we're talking about cancer, you know, we'll talk about that for now. You know, you will then, you might pitch up at your GP, for example, and say, I'm really worried, I've got, I've had this cancer, um, but actually this is my second or third cancer, you know, and uh, the GP might say, right, you need to go to your regional genetic centre. So in the UK and um, in Wales, Northern Ireland, Scotland, we have these um, uh, genetic centres, if you like. Um, so it's, it's nationally funded and um, you will be sent there, you would see maybe a geneticist or a genetic counsellor. They all take a history and decide whether or not genetic testing is right for you. Maybe as a result of being diagnosed with a cancer, your multidisciplinary team, maybe your oncologist um, or your surgeon has said, oh gosh, you know, I'm not sure about this. Or like we were talking about earlier, the tumor has stained in a certain way and we're a bit worried. Um, and previously, again, you'd go to a genetic center, but increasingly we're looking at things called mainstreaming. So that is where, you know, professionals like you or I that are in the clinical setting, um, if we're there and we're having the conversation, we are going to be able to say, do you know what, I'm a bit worried and let's, you know, take a blood test and get some genetic testing done as long as it fits a certain criteria. Because as you just mentioned, there is a significant waiting time involved. Um, and it could be three to six months or sometimes even longer for regional genetic centers. And actually, if the test leads to us altering your cancer treatment, then actually we need to get those results really, really fast at the beginning, because otherwise what's going to happen is we're going to miss out on the potential to treat people. And that can be absolutely game changing. Um, because if you take um, and I, I keep talking about Lynch, but it is Lynch syndrome day, so I am allowed. But if you take things like bowel cancer, um, Lynch syndrome, the cancer tends to be something called microsatellite unstable. And we know from research that uh, medications that belong to the immunotherapy group of, of, of medications will be far more effective in those particular type of tumors. So um, at the moment, if you have uh, metastatic bowel cancer uh, and you have Lynch syndrome or you have a microsatellite unstable cancer, then you are eligible for immunotherapy. And we have seen patients with metastatic cancer who've been given a palliative diagnosis and then with immunotherapy, the cancer has disappeared and they have survived. So this is absolutely game changing. So we can't allow the long waits because we may miss that opportunity. So actually, we need to look at new ways of working in the NHS, and we absolutely rely and must have our um, 
genetic uh, colleagues, geneticists, genetic counsellors, because we need them for support. They need to help us in this. Um, but some of the work um, we might be able to perform um, you know, in the clinical field to try and speed up this process. But of course, that's why I'm here and that's why I'm talking to you, because this is also a field where, as healthcare professionals, understandably, it's new. We're all quite nervous about it. We want to get it right. We don't want to be caught in difficult conversations. We don't want to say the wrong thing. But actually, what we've got to keep in our heads is if it changes somebody's diagnosis, then it's always worth it. Um, so, so, yeah. Vicky, I'm just thinking, if I was a patient listening to the podcast, I would absolutely be bowled over by some of the things you said, thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I've recently been diagnosed with cancer. I want this. I need this. What, who, how, how is anyone supposed to know or find out whether or not this is appropriate for them, um, their cancer and potentially the impact that it's going to have on them? Really, really good question. And it's something that I have a lot of discussions about because essentially we as patients, if we take off our healthcare professional hats and we put ourselves in with everybody else and if we imagine ourselves as a patient, I guess we have to have a certain level of knowledge to ask those questions in the first place. So you will have some patients that will immediately go away, think, oh my goodness, I've got this diagnosis of breast cancer or, or leukemia or, or whatever cancer we're talking about, Google everything, find out, ah, there are these treatments available, ask their doctor and find out that way. Um, but there's a big issue with equity of access there because if you're not used to doing that, maybe if you're older and you're not used to asking or questioning your medical professionals, if you don't have access to the internet, um, you know, then you're not gonna know the questions to ask. There is huge work going on to try and engage patients um, in this field to make sure that they understand and know the questions to ask. Um, and lots of research going in to lots of different groups um, of patients uh, to try and reach more disadvantaged groups. Um, and at the same time, this is why I'm here and why I'm flying the flag for please get interested in this field um, because you might be a brilliantly educated patient and you might sit in front of your healthcare professional and maybe they are not sure about the advice to give. So for example, it's highlighting that there is now a national NHS genomic medicine service, um, knowing to find out where in your region you know, are, are the people to go to for advice. Um, I'll, we'll put some resources at the end of this podcast so you, you know, people can link into that. Uh, so, because it doesn't matter if you don't actually know the answer, what's important is not to say, no, you're not eligible, or I don't know, or it's to say, I'm not sure, but I know where I can find the information and I'll get that for you. Um, and, and in terms of patients, I guess it's just working with, you know, like I'm doing with Macmillan, working with charitable groups, raising the awareness, and also highlighting what genomics can't do and I think that's a really really important message as well at the moment because it isn't at, it isn't yet the all singing all dancing will profile your tumour and will get all the answers at the moment we're at a stage where we can ask tons of quest questions we could sequence all these cancers and that's a part of you know the legacy of the 100,000 Genomes Project. You know, we had this grand plan and it was amazing and we did it. We sequenced 100,000 genomes, but that came out with huge amounts of information, but we don't have all the answers from that information. So there's got to be a bit of reality check about what it can deliver. So there are small uh, components, specific cancers, specific treatments where it is absolutely amazing, but it's not the answer for everybody and of course we've got to grab hold of that information and build on it for the treatments and our knowledge to, to improve so there's a huge amount of work to do and at the moment I would say it is very difficult for patients um, and it's also quite difficult for us as healthcare professionals um, kind of wading through all that um, as well so there, there's no easy answers at the moment I would say but we're working on it 
Oh, thank you for that. And we'll definitely link everything um, so that patients and healthcare professionals can find it easily. Um, so developments in um, genomic medicine are obviously demonstrating lots of notable success and it's amazing um, in terms of diagnosing and managing rare diseases and cancer. But how can it be used more from a personalised care perspective, which I know obviously is something that Macmillan are very passionate about? So I think it's quite important to, to make a bit of a distinction here because when we're thinking of personalised care and that that Macmillan talks about and that is very patient focused is is what we traditionally have done as healthcare professionals. We want everybody's care to be personalised to their needs. You know, so when we think about the health needs assessment, for example, you know, we as a healthcare professional might be like, oh my goodness, uh, the, the most important thing is that we've got to send this patient off to surgery and get that cancer cut out, for example. But that might not actually be what the patient is focused on because they might be in a job where you know they don't get sick pay um, and they're focusing on getting stuff, stuff sorted out in order to get you know to, to, to make their family financially secure before having their surgery so it's about finding out what's important to the patient and making sure that the treatment is tailored um, around that person's needs however in genomics what you'll also see written a lot about is something called personalized medicine and at the moment I get lots of comments from people because they're getting really confused about all the terminology and in, when we say personalized medicine in genomics we're actually talking about the fact in a way it's similar that a one-size-fits-all approach doesn't work and that doesn't work whatever you're talking about does it but it means that for example we're going to be subclassifying to huge degrees in the future different cancers. So instead of saying you've got breast cancer, you've got bowel cancer, you know, you've got uh, blood cancer, there's going to be huge amounts of substratification, subclassification of those cancers, and they'll all be treated in, in very different ways. And actually, you know, this is what we're talking about when we're talking about genomic profiling. We're taking a piece of a uh, tumour sample from patient, we're sending it off, we're, we're extracting the DNA, we're putting it through a fancy next generation sequencing machine, we're getting all this basically computer data and very clever bioinformaticians are, are reading this data and saying, da -da, this is this is the result. And in the future, it will almost be like everybody's cancer is unique it's a bit like cancer is going to be like a, a genetic fingerprint I guess if you like does that make sense where we're going to be getting reports and everybody there'll be certain treatments obviously that will need to be similar but everybody's cancer will be need to be treated differently and so personalized medicine is about using medicine itself so pharmacogenomics uh, and making sure that you know we tailor treatments to people and we differ doses and we give different medications depending on our own body's response um, and the same thing for uh, looking at um, uh, you, you know variants in the cancer and, and things like that um, and all the different kind of preventative strategies and treatments and hopefully that will then with all that information that personalized medicine will then lead to better personalized care in terms of treatments but of course there will be all the other things that are important to patients surrounding that as well we can't just be uber clinically focused we have to think about all the holistic needs of the patients that surround that as well so it's it's quite a big oh gosh when i'm talking about it like this i think oh gosh it's quite a big piece of work <laughs> i can you already know, um, i can already picture vicky my students going <laughs> joe i've just learned the tnm staging system i can't possibly learn anything else <laughs> subcategories of other things because i love it when i'm teaching and i'm going right this is the staging system for this and then oh but there is also this so hearing you say that vicky is going to send them into a cold sweat <laughs> Oh, I don't, I don't want to stress anyone out because that is a really important message. You know, just I think you have to break things down. And if, you know, if you're a therapeutic radiographer listening to me, then your interest lies in a specific area and your knowledge, especially to begin with, start it off small, find out what you need to know. And as things interest you, you can then build on that knowledge there's no way that you can know everything. I literally, I mean, that's another reason we do what we do because we're all learning things every single day. And there is no person that works 
in the NHS or in healthcare that can say, I know everything. I mean, maybe that's part of the beauty of it, that we are learning every day. So please don't get stressed by what I say. Um, I, you know, I, I'm supposed to be helping people, but literally my knowledge, you know, I know about one area and I need to know about lots of other areas. So none of us know all the answers. And that's really important thing to highlight to everybody. It's such a fascinating topic area, because as you said, there's so many different options. I mean, yeah, we, you know, you learn about suppressor genes and all these things, or like I like skincare, but everything is so different, and it, it's that vast multitude of it. I know we've talked kind of around bowel cancer and some of the genes. You mentioned BRCA earlier, so quite an interesting one where you don't necessarily, and some patients don't necessarily end up getting a cancer diagnosis because they will find out through their family member they've had BRCA. Is that something that you've looked into as well? Yeah, so that's a really important point to mention. Like I was talking earlier about cancer prevention. So not everybody gets a cancer if you have a cancer predisposition syndrome. And sometimes you'll hear about things where people say, oh, it's not fully penetrant. Now, what on earth are they talking about? But what they actually mean is, you know, you, I could be diagnosed with BRCA because, say, my mum had breast cancer and had a BRCA diagnosis, but I might actually never get a breast cancer. I'm obviously at very high risk compared to the general population, but with prevention strategies, with scanning, um, with more knowledge. So I might not have known anything about breast cancer before, but being in touch with healthcare professionals and looking things up for myself, I might then be so much more aware of doing breast checks, you know, highlighting symptoms to the GP, for example, that you can put all these sorts of prevention strategies in for yourself. Um, and I guess it then depends on you as a person whether, you know, some people will naturally be highly anxious to have something like a, a, a gene that predisposes them to cancer. and, and you know, anxiety around that will need managing. Some will be very relaxed and say, oh, it's, you know, it's fine. I've got all these strategies and there'll be everything in, you know, in between. But actually, that's what we're all about. We want to prevent people from getting cancer. And hopefully, um, you know, working in this field, genomics will help with that. I mean, a big driver for genomics is that we'll either prevent people from getting cancer diagnoses and, and lots of other diagnoses around their health and um, but also get people diagnosed a lot earlier and um, so some of the cancers that we know are difficult to treat brain tumors pancreatic cancer and um, some you know lung cancer those sorts of things where traditionally we diagnose people late this is a field where hopefully we're going to get a far earlier diagnosis and um, and you've probably heard of um, braille and the liquid biopsies and, and the trial that's going on at the moment. But that's um, where we are looking to see whether a cancer, and you know, a cancer that we've not diagnosed yet, um, whether it sheds some DNA and whether we can pick it up from blood samples, from people's blood samples, way, way before we may have traditionally seen it on a scan or when we've done a colonoscopy, for example, or something like that. So it's all about prevention in all of these cases and inherited cancer has taught us a lot and then we can filter that through and um, to look at you know what we would call the well population and finding out if we can diagnose things a lot sooner that's quite a nice way to go into what do you envisage genomics in the future but i will ask you very quickly do you think yeah. that with looking at early detection what do you think for the future that it would be like the uptake of the general public? So obviously nowadays, lots of younger people are on TikTok, so they watch a video about something, whereas the older generation would normally have read a leaflet or something in the newspaper. So kind of technology is advancing so much. Do you think the uptake of getting genetic testing or just being part of these sort of trials might be a bit better? I mean, I really hope so. I mean, I think we're starting to see now, you know, patients... Um, we've had a few referrals actually of patients who've gone and had, um, you know, they buy the, the tests from the chemist or going to have private genomic profile in the 23andMe that you've heard of and things like that. And um, so people are obviously aware and interested in this. Um, and that's good and bad because sometimes you're not quite sure what you're getting tested for and then you've got a big shock at the end of it. And I think we as healthcare professionals, you know, TikTok, my kids are on TikTok, are, there's some of this that 
I don't really understand. And Vicky, we we'll get, get you on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> we need, but, oh, it's stressing me out. It's stressing me out being on screen. But we need to engage with that audience in the ways that they learn. And, the, you know, because actually, if that is the best way of engaging and getting that conversation started and making people more aware and, you know, wanting to participate in things like research, then actually that's 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 where, where we've got to go and um, so i think there's a huge amount of interest around this and it does polarize people because some people will want everything doing i want this please do my testing and i'm so fascinated and i want the research and blah blah and then others will be like you're not having my data you know real worries about where is this data going? What are you doing with this information uh, around? And I've given you two extremes there, but and there's everything in between. Um, so there's there's a lot of um, engagement work uh, that needs to be done, um, and that is improving. Once upon a time, you know, we were doing everything for the patient, but never invited the patient to participate. And now, quite rightly, patients should be central to every discussion we have, and genomics is no different to that. I think it's interesting i think from my viewpoint maybe because i'm a healthcare professional is if i can give you my blood and you help hundreds of other people that's what i'd want to do but i understand the the data protection side because you know that is your genetic you know it's like so you wouldn't want someone to take your blood and do testing on it for example without your consent but it's that sort of thing isn't it um exactly exactly i completely agree and um you know i work with lots of lots of uh, people from all walks of life and you know people do have very very differing opinions about lots of different things and as you say I think because we work in this field we're more likely to go I'll do anything you know take take it and learn from it but that's not everybody's opinion um, and we have to understand uh, and respect that if we're going to move this forward if you have money anything there's no object what would you want from genomics Oh gosh! Well, think, I mean, think big here. Be ambitious. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're hopefully in the future we're going to move to the fact where we're going to just you know, sequence everybody's tumor, for example. So at the moment, it's it's specific reasons that we will do sequencing, um, and for example, you know, metastatic disease to try and see if there are there are new treatments, or if people stop responding to treatments, we'll do it. But in the future, I would expect that everybody has access to as much as possible and our knowledge is there as well and with that I mean there are you know the issues we face at the moment are the ones that I'd like a great big bunch of money to sort out for me and that is workforce so you know we all need more of us um, uh, and we need us to be upskilled upskilled is a bad word because it makes it sound as if you know but we want to have that knowledge and as we've described there's lots of issues with that um, and so we need lots of money for workforce and we need lots of money to progress research so that our scientific knowledge the actual knowledge that we have is caught up with the the huge amounts of information that's coming through because as I said earlier we don't we've got all this data but we don't necessarily have all the answers and it's you know, I'm, I'm not going to lie to everybody. It costs a lot of money. When I mentioned earlier this magical thing, liquid biopsies, you know, it is not cheap to take a blood test um, and, you know, find out if there is circulating tumour DNA. And it's absolutely vital. But at the moment, we have to be selective about where we use these treatments and what patients we, we use it on and, and the, the, the positives are, as I said, aligned to maybe smaller groups of patients with specific genetic alterations, for example, or actionable uh, variants that we find. So, you know, it, it will require huge amounts of, of money and workforce, in, workforce infrastructure. But what I think is really reassuring is that we are actually really leading the way. The 100,000 Genome Project is is known around the world and we've built a whole now genomic medicine service based on this and although you know the nhs you know it's it's it can sometimes get a few knocks and you know it's not performing and it's not doing this and we know there's lots of issues but it has been fantastic in the way that it's it's dealt with this topic and think about covid you know i hate to mention it again in a podcast but think about the knowledge that we gained from the use of genomics uh, and real-time um, uh, sequencing of 
viral RNA to enable us to be able to look at the different variants that have come out of that. Ten years ago, our ability to respond to COVID only 10 years ago would have been completely different and it's truly game changing but it has its limitations and a lot of those are to do with money so um i don't know how much i'd need quite a lot i guess <laughs> <laughs> that's okay we ask you to be ambitious but it's very exciting to siphon see. some off as well yes you know you've got lots of expenses <laughs> <laughs> I just had a very quick question, Vicky. You know, you mentioned around the tumour cells or the DNA uh, going around in the bloodstream and they're being picked up. Would every sort of tumour have that or would it only be specific groups of tumours just for any, just for my understanding? Well, this is what we don't know. So at the moment, the, the, the GRAIL study is looking at healthy, well, hopefully healthy, we don't know, that's why we're doing the study, um, healthy volunteers and taking blood samples and they've got together a series of you know a series of molecular profiles that they think are the right ones to tell us what we need to know but hopefully the research will be a success and we'll find cancers early and we can say yes but i'm sure there'll be some not so great results so the answer is we don't know yet whether it will be but i i personally feel this is where we will see huge leaps and bounds over the next few years. And as our knowledge increases, hopefully the, the, the cost of it will also decrease. Because like with sequencing the human genome, you know, when, it, when we did it back in 2001, do you know what I mean? It cost an absolute fortune and we never thought we'd be able to do it in a clinical setting, but you know, 20 years on uh, and we can. So as we do more of this and we learn more, the price and the cost will come down. And that's really important. So the reality of maybe in, I don't know, five, let's be optimistic, five years time going to your pharmacy, having a blood test and potentially maybe diagnosing something that then gets referred straight to your GP. That, that all sounds quite promising and pretty phenomenal in terms of actually going some way to cure cancer, doesn't it? Yeah. Definitely, definitely. And and in the same way, at the end of the pathway, if you've had cancer, you know how now well, we, we traditionally have scanning and things or, you know, to tell us if a cancer has come back. But quite often we don't, you know, by the time we've found a metastatic, uh, a patient with metastatic disease, it might be too late. But if you can imagine doing a blood test in real time more frequently, and finding out information in real time before that cancer is visible on something like a scan. So, you know, all the way through, um, this could be a, a real game changer if, and I always urge caution, we have the right information. So what you were saying earlier about, you know, um, what information do we need? It, we, don't, it, we don't have all the answers yet, but I'm confident that we will get there actually. Um, you know, cancer, as we is on every teaching session, it's a, a disease of the genome. Um, <laughs> and I say that, you know, tongue in cheek, but it, it yeah. is. So actually, even if someone says, I don't know anything about this genomics business and they've worked in cancer their whole life, they do. They just they're not connecting their knowledge with this topic, but they do know um, because they're working completely within it. And a lot of the treatments they're offering and you know what I mean, it, it, it is without them realizing potentially all to do with genomics and um, so if you're listening to this you know it already you see, you just don't realize it. <laughs> you're highly inspirational and motivating i love it vicky um can i just ask and i, I do have to stop asking questions because i think we could go on all night uh Naaman and i were texting going this is amazing she's so good and we're definitely going to get you on tiktok doing a whole ge <laughs> genomics Please series no. vicky oh, your kids are going to be so proud of you they'll be um, embarrassed <laughs> joe they will be embarrassed <laughs> i'm telling you now they're teenagers they will not want to see me <laughs> well maybe maybe we'll do in they'll between. get we'll over it in Instagram. a few years <laughs> <laughs> Um, but Vicky, in terms of you were saying about the infrastructure, and I think that is something that we definitely see as part of late effects now, that there's much more knowledge about kind of cancer treatments and the late effects. And something that I've definitely seen even today is around that psychosocial support, you know, and, and having that in place. 
Do you find that that is also obviously a requirement within your own clinics when you're definitely talking to patients, but do you think that that's something that would have to increase alongside all of these extra um, extra ways to be able to diagnose, but also potentially having quite you know a big impact on people's lives if they are discovered to have not just a predisposition, but obviously a cancer um, when they weren't even expecting to have a diagnosis and it was just part of a routine, say, GP appointment or something like that. Yeah, definitely. And I think there's also something to be said. You know, if you if you diagnose a cancer really early and it's it can be... I was listening to somebody um, the other day and they were saying, you know, one-stop breast connects, for example, and if, if, if we diagnose a breast cancer really early and people can go in and, you know, have a lumpectomy and be out the same day and everyone's like, oh, cancer treatment in a day, fantastic, fantastic, and, you know, friends are like, oh, we don't need to worry, they had it done and dusted in a day, but actually that person can have real psychological um, uh, traumas from that, maybe because it was dealt with so quickly. Um, and they didn't have time to process it and before they'd even realised what had happened oh the treatment's finished and there's no one left to talk about it so it's a similar situation if you're diagnosing something very early and maybe there's some simple treatment and then people are sent off and if there isn't the right support in place are people going to be coming unnecessarily anxious or are we going to turn into a whole population where we we can have so many tests at so many times that we're just going to be walking around in a perpetual state of anxiety about our health. I mean, you know, I don't know. But I think that is where the allied health professions, um, uh, you know, I know traditionally, obviously, you know, the clinical nurse specialists and, and all that. But think about, you know, I'm, I'm on a therapeutic radiography podcast, but, you know, you are spending in clinical practice all that time, every single day with people, the amount of support that you potentially don't realise you're offering to people and you are that life support. But then of course, once it's not the it's not when you're having treatment that may be the most stressful thing, it's afterwards when you're on your own at home. And I guess it's encouraging people to link with charitable support, use the advice lines from Macmillan and, and all the other uh, charities to speak up, to get people aware of speaking up when they're struggling, uh, to get better connections with mental health services. You know, I, I'm talking too much now, but I mean, there is so much work. And part of that is about us as people as well, because if we're the sort of people that don't like asking for help, or we don't say when we're struggling, there is, a, there is actually an onus on us to use, you know, healthcare systems and, 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 and support networks and things you know effectively to, to protect ourselves as well so i think there's a lot of work that we can do in understanding our health and um, learning about you know symptoms knowing when to ask for help being proactive about our mental health so making sure we're exercising you know if we like using apps and things uh, like calm and headspace do you know what i mean we've got quite a lot of work to do in, as individuals to, to manage uh, how we how we deal with with things like this, so it's a really interesting topic. I could talk all night. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a separate podcast all in itself. Yeah. We could, and and obviously our social media um, series that we're going to do, Vicky, with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Vicky, our last question that we always ask guests is around top tips, and you have actually through through the entire podcast given us quite a few. But if you if there were a few key things that you just wish everyone would go away with that lasting Vicky message in their heads, what is it that you'd want them to go away with? Don't don't be put off. Don't think that you can't do it or that the language isn't tailored for you. Um, find a way because if you can't understand it, your patients are not going to be able to understand it. So we've got to find a way through the language. Um, and I'd also also say listen to the patients we need to do that much more and if we're talking about inherited disease you did a fantastic um, podcast with Christine around BRCA um, and I'd urge anyone who hasn't listened to it to go back um, and listen to that podcast because she speaks really eloquently about her experience of having an inherited condition how it affected her how having surgery affected her um, and I think that she made me think about things that I hadn't 
maybe realized and I've done this a long time and I'm still learning every single day from the patients that I come across so whether you work with patients with inherited disease or whether you're dealing with cancer patients they will teach you more than than we are going to teach them and I think that if we could improve our listening learn just to listen more and learn from our patients that is probably those two things are my top tips don't be stressed listen to our patients <laughs> perfect advice i love it ah oh, well thank you so much vicky it's been amazing and such an interesting topic so thank you for all our um for listening to rad chat your hosts today have been joe mcnamara and name and anderson a huge thank you again to Vicky Cuthill. Head over to our YouTube page to see a live recording of this podcast. If you're utilising the podcast for CPD purposes, consider the reflective questions posted along with links to resources and literature discussed. To receive your accredited CPD um, certificate, please complete the Google form attached. Um, our next guest to feature will be Luke Dakes, who will be discussing his role at CERN and Flash Radio Set radiotherapy so thank you for listening and take care bye everyone